Brokerages doing it, and then I started looking at the agents. And then me, the way my mind works, I wanted to see everything they were, they were doing, that they're doing currently. And within about 15 minutes, I'm like, I know how to do, I, I know what to do to get this agent's business right here. I know what to do to take this agent's business right here. I, and, and the only reason is because I'm studying. I'm studying, studying. So instead of when you see someone doing something really well, say, well, what aren't they doing? The agents in this market are doing. When I say very few, I'm talking less than 5% of agents in your market are doing. And I don't think, I think maybe four, four of them might be doing it really well. Personal videos, v personal videos. The properties, like we're spending money on, on property videos and personal videos. Get your phone. That's my phone right there that's on that tripod. Get your phone. Put it in selfie mode. Record a video of you walking on the beach. Record a video of you talking about list price to sales price ratios, months of inventory, absorption rates, median days on market. Yourself talking now, everyone's phone, what is it now? That's a TV now. YouTube TV, Netflix, Hulu is on your phone. Who do we see on TV? Unless you're a Kardashian, we see experts on the phone, right? No one laughed at that? that okay, in Miami, it gets a good laugh because I usually have a Kardashian or two in the audience. Okay, okay. seen talking about market stats. Usually experts are seen talking about what's happening in the neighborhood. We aren't doing it. Right? Very few. Go on YouTube, go on Facebook, go on Instagram. Very few real estate agents, real estate professionals are using the form of video, video format to excel. So now, instead of me putting a property on, uh, on video, on YouTube, Facebook, what if I come on as a real estate agent? So my big way that I broke into the luxury market is I grabbed my phone, my tripod, and this lavalier mic right here, and I had one more microphone. I just started interviewing affluent people. I just started interviewing. Everyone loves to talk about who? Themselves. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a platform to talk about yourself, and I'm doing this on Facebook. It's not like a sexy TV. And then I just said, I have a web series. I have a web series called The Two Six. I'm going to interview affluent individuals for 26 minutes unedited, right? So now I'm doing, hey, 26 minutes unedited, uncut, just raw, be real, be authentic. We could talk about anything you want to, but I only require 30 minutes of your time. It's gonna take two minutes for us to get set up, two minutes to break down, 26 minutes to get, you know, for the interview. Now, I'm asking them about anything that they want to talk about. Of course, I'm going to, you know, hey, what would you like to talk about? I see you here. I followed you. I've done my research. I know this about you. What would you like to talk about, though? Maybe they have a passion project that they're working on. Maybe it's something that, you know, no one ever asked them about. They're always asking business. They never ask. So I'm going to say, you know, many, many lobster season open. Right? You all familiar, right? Many lobster season open. You know, so let's talk about that. What is your experience? Why would a sane human being be willing to stick his hand in a hole that he can't see? Oh, well, Neil, let me tell you all about it. Now, when I post that on social and I share it, who are they going, and I tag them in it, who are they going to, even though their accounts are usually private, who are they, once they friend me, every one of their friends are going to see it. Right? And now, I have not sold anything. I have not asked them for anything. I've given them a platform to speak. You all see where the opportunities are, right? And that's something that you do with your phone. You grab a friend, grab your child, grab your colleague. You do one for me, I do one for you. Flip it, okay? Does that make sense? All right, where am I? All right, resources real quick. Oh, so before I do that, I do want to jump out of here because I want, you are floridarealtors.org, floridarealtors.org. Oh, you're still not seeing it. Okay, let me go here. Florida, okay, now we're seeing it. Floridarealtors.org, this is where I got, I get all of my information and this is what makes me an expert in the eyes of the affluent. 
what I'm going to ask you all to do, go into, can everyone see right over here? So it's, it's kind of, let me see if I can make this a little bit. Where is, okay. So you all are gonna have to bear with me here then since I can't get it. FloridaRealtors.org. FloridaRealtors with an S dot org. And, and here's the part of the action plan. This is where you're going to become the expert. All right. So we want to go to FloridaRealtors.org. On the left hand side, research and stats. Research and stats. You want to click on that. Now they're doing this big push about the new website, right? I don't know if you all have been. At the top, it says visit our new website here. Do not try the new website for the research and stats because the stats aren't loaded yet, all right? So don't go there. So just go over here to the side, research and stats here, and then you're gonna click on Florida Market Reports. Who's currently using the Florida Market Reports? All right, here's what I'm going to do. Right here on the top, you see it says click here for the 2019 release schedule. The, the early bird gets the worm. The first one out of the gate usually wins. So what I do is I know. So it was yesterday, July 23rd, you'll see. July 23rd, the June existing home and condo report came out. So yesterday, let me make sure. No, so, okay, so on the 23rd, which was what, Tuesday? Tuesday, it, can, it usually comes out right around lunchtime. At about one o'clock, I was sitting down in front of my desk at home with my phone and I did a market update report about the luxury market in Broward County single family homes. And I did that video within an hour of that report coming out and I sent that to my sphere of influence, I sent it to my clients, prospects and fears, I'm sorry, and, sphere, and um, client prospects and uh, customers, and then I sent that to out of area realtors. So all of my agents who are in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, I sent them a video of me reading information right here from this website and I'm going to do the exact same thing on August 7th, August 21st, September 19th, because I'm utilizing the power of video. Now I'm seen as an expert to agents outside of the market. Now, what do we want to send to them? You'll see here where some reports are publicly available. You all see that? We don't care about any report that's publicly available. We don't care, we don't want it, we don't need it. What we want are the member only reports. That means that you must be a member of Florida Realtor, right? So, and here's why. So I came and the report that I love using is the quarterly report. It's the zip code stats by county. The zip code stats by county, it's a members only report but it tells me almost everything I need to know. Now, this is for Q1. So Q2 doesn't come out until, absolutely, see there we are. So now what I want to do is, I come in, I pulled up the Indian River report, and I did this one last night. So now I can come in, and I can start looking at zip codes. Now immediately, what I wanted to do, and here's what, and this is why it's so important for you to know, right? We talked about uh, the number of closed transactions. I'm looking, if I'm trying to get into this area, does it make sense just based off the number of transactions? Would I focus on zip code 948? It just doesn't make sense for me breaking in, for me to try to get into a market that only has six closed sales. Does everyone see why that's important? Now, if I'm trying to break into the luxury realm, into the luxury niche, and we're thinking in the price bands according to the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing, would I work in the zip code 962? 962, absolutely not, because the median sales price is 175. What zip code do I want to focus on? Everyone knows that, you guys are like, duh. But guess what, guess what, me not being from this market, in three minutes, I knew immediately where I was going as far as the zip code. Okay, and then I came in and I looked at the, um, there's another report in here. 
and it's the county report. So I started looking at the number of closed sales for the month of June. Remember I said that the June reports are out, okay? Uh, they came out on the 23rd. So from 500,000 to 600,000, 27 closed sales in single family. From 600,000 to a, a buck shy of a million, 19 transactions. And then a million dollars or more, 13 transactions. And this is for me coming from down in Miami, right? But now I will do a video Hey, Indian River County, for those of you looking to buy or sell, here's your monthly market update report. And I'm giving it to them right here. And all it took was a couple of clicks of the mouse. I'm not going in. I don't have a research department that's going to pull this information for me. It's just that the 180,000 realtors that have access to it, there might be 15 of us doing this on a consistent basis. And the four other 14, I know, and we're talking about the business and we're getting the referrals back and forth because I'm coming in and I'm like, I'm going to see them in a couple of weeks up in August. How many deals did you get from because of your market update report? And we're going to, uh, this, where are they coming from? And then we start knowing if it's coming from the Northeast or if they're coming over from California or right now, Texas. Right. And so that's when we start uh, to talk and we start sharing uh, information. Talk about median days on market. And the reason this information is so valuable, regardless of whether you're working with a buyer or seller, these same stats, once you know these three key metrics, a list price to sales price ratio, months of inventory, and median days on market, you can have an intelligent conversation and communicate with anyone. If you're a buyer or seller, do you care how long it's taking a property to sell? Do you care whether the properties are closing at 97% of asking price or 84% of ask price? Absolutely. Do you care that there's 13 months of inventory for properties that are a million dollars or more? Yes. For the 500,000 to 600,000, that's like five months. Do you care about that? Absolutely. Now, the 13 months of inventory, if you are a seller, that's a bad thing. So what do we do with that information? We take that same information as 13.1 months of inventory for a million dollar plus listings. In your video, in your communication, whatever marketing you're going to do, you're going to target buyers. Now might be a great time for you to purchase because the months of inventory is rising. Now we're at 13.1 months if you're looking to purchase in the million plus price range. If you're going to do a Facebook advertising or if you're going to do a call to action, Use maybe your pitch might be uh, something to the point where you're asking them or you're offering them ask for the, the or, or the price bands find out or contact me for the price bands for the greatest value in the luxury market. How are you going to decide what the greatest value is? You're going to go to the same report and you're going to come over and look and see in the luxury market list price to sales price ratio would be right now is 92 percent. So in zip code 963 is 92 percent. OK, so what you might do is by you having this information from across the state, you might find somewhere that instead of coming to Vero, maybe they want to go to another area. OK, for I know that in Broward, one of our very luxurious neighborhoods right now, the list price and sales price ratio is about, is about 84 percent. One zip code over is at 97 percent. OK, 97 percent, they have about nine months of inventory in the luxury realm. Where it is 84%, they have about 16 months of inventory. So I'm telling, so my call to action is, find out where to get the greatest value for your book. The affluent, understand value. They value value more than price. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so when you start speaking, I hear stuff that everyone has access to. Right? And if you aren't using it, I respectfully tell you that you're missing a huge opportunity to be better than everyone else. Like this is unfair. This is unfair. OK, so that, that's just a quick thing I wanted to share with you. Everyone got that FloridaRealtors.org. Then you're going to research and stats and you're going to build from there. We're good. OK, um, now that should be something hopefully that everyone is utilizing very, very soon. All right, so this is, remember I talked about I love the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing and it's not so much because of the, um, the designation, but it's because of the reports and the information that you get. I am a numbers junkie. I am a numbers nerd because it is a great equalizer when it comes to the industry. If I can communicate effectively what you care about, all else dissipates. OK, so this is like something uh, or, or the quality of the report. Now, be very cautious. The reports that you get, 
I hardly ever, hardly ever send a printed report or the information I have just over to a client. Hardly ever. It's because then they really don't need me. My job is to communicate and to explain what this means. List price to sales price ratio, okay, uh, what does that mean? I did it with you all when we talked about median versus average. In my videos, I would say, I'm sure you're aware of the difference between list price and sales price ratio or assessment ratios. And if I'm targeting New Yorkers, I'm going to say, here in South Florida, we use list price to sales price ratio in instead of assessment because now guess what they're like ah this guy gets me he knows he's been here before he's dealt with me before does that make sense to everyone so these are some of the reports so i might get this this is luxury inventory uh, this would probably be if i'm not mistaken for fort lauderdale all right and what i would do is i would come the black is the total inventory and here's why i care about this information so the black in July of 2018, there were 292 single family homes in the price band between 1 million and 1.5 million minus a buck. Okay, 292 available, 18 actually sold. Now, I don't really care about that because this is usually in the back. This is what has already happened. What I care about is the fact that I have this information and I'm going to sound like an expert when I communicate this information to someone who has no idea. So sellers always think there are fewer properties available than there really are. Buyers always think there are more properties available than there really are, right? So I'm going to use, it doesn't matter which price band, it doesn't matter which report, as long as you know and you're studying, then you can use the information. Uh, it would talk about you know, whether, how much sold in June versus July, uh, price bands, uh, days on market. Days on market is going to be a huge deal whether you're a buyer or a seller. When we're talking to affluent and in, in any uh, customer, when we're talking about days on market and their time frames, be sure to clarify when they say they need to sell in six months or a year. If that means they need to be under contract in that time frame, or if they need to be out or in in that time frame. Especially when we start talking about the, the higher the sales price, usually the longer the escrow period. Okay, not that there's something wrong, it's just that there's really no rush. Okay, we're good there. Understand the difference when they have to, when they want to be under contract versus when they want to sell. So those are just more reports. I want to go into resources before we take our next break. There are a few resources that are on your sheet and there are some that are not that I want to make sure that you have because these are going to be the ones that are going to set you even further ahead of the competition. The first one, Institute for Luxury Home Marketing, ILHM course. The Institute for Luxury Home Marketing, so we should be Go back. I think we'll go back. It's okay. So we're right there. Okay. So under resources for growth, Institute for Luxury Home Marketing course. Now I want to tell you, I took the course. The gentleman in the back took the course. I'm going to tell you, it is about 500 bucks, maybe 600 now. If you don't know that you want to do luxury, do not take that course first. Okay. Do not get online. Jack Cotton. I don't know if you all know who Jack Cotton is. He's up in Cape Cod. Become a student of Jack Cotton. C-O-T-T-O-N. He is one of my mentors, a fantastic guy. He has been doing what I'm talking about. He's been recording videos, putting them on YouTube for 10, like Cotton, C-O-T-T-O-N. He's been putting information out, telling people how to succeed for 10 years every week. He's dropping stuff every week. He's dropping jewels. And some of his videos that are five years old might have 15 views on them. So I'm telling you, he's super, super sharp. He's giving it away. Uh, and then I'm going to ask from Jack Cotton. Okay, Dr. Thomas J. Stanley. If you're familiar with The Millionaire Next Door, you might not know who Dr. Thomas J. Stanley is, but he is the author of The Millionaire Next Door. Networking with the Affluent is one of the best books I believe that you should add to your library, Networking with the Affluent. It helps us to understand who the affluent are. And many times, because they don't look and act rich. 
All right. And understanding that when we network with them, a few key words, a few key, the, the way you carry yourself, uh, the, the way that the confidence in, in, in you that you have when you're interacting are going to speak volumes. The millionaire mind is a good one. He has another one that is not on the list. It's called stop acting rich. Stop acting. Okay, we have on the list Rich Buyer, Rich Seller by Lori Moore Moore from the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing. I would tell you, I have the book. It's great if you read it 10 years ago. Okay, so this book has a lot of antiquated information in it. It has some good parts of all the books on the list. This would be the least important one to get unless you're going to get the book and you're going to meet Lori and then she autographs it for you and then you use this, remember, because this goes back to the endorsement, having that third party endorsement. So it's not a fantastic book for today because a lot of things it talks about is outdated, but if you have it and then you go to a marketing consultation and you put this down and then you, oh, you're like, oh, she said your name, okay. Right. So understand, remember, we, we, we're intentional about what we do at every step. OK, so that's why I have that one. Um, power marketing for luxury real estate. Dave Machonsky and his wife, Linda. This is a fantastic book to get. Get this one for the information. Every book that I tell you is not for electronic version. Do not get them in the electronic version. They will do you no good. These are workbooks. These are books for you to dog ear the pages, for you to highlight, for you to go back in month and month and month and year after. Power Marketing for Luxury Real Estate. Dave Machonsky, what he has mastered, especially for the higher price bands. Um, he was doing this 10 years ago, what we're just catching on now, the idea of the, look of the auction. Right. Set creating an auction environment. So everything Dave Machonsky does um, and, and teaches as far as marketing is to build a live auction experience, building that urgency. It's hard to build urgency when you have 13 months of inventory, 16 months of inventory. Some of our markets have 27 months of inventory. It's hard to build urgency. But then he talks about how to position properties. We don't price properties. We don't do reductions. We do reposition and, re and position. OK, so that's what that's some of the verbiage that we we'll use instead of price reductions. We'll do a repositioning. And Dave uh, talks. Uh, oh, so we don't do price reduction. We do a reposition. Mm -hmm. And so we never price a, a property. We position a property on the market. All right. And, and, and so then another thing we do, stop when I say we uh, and I, I'm not telling you all what we what you have to do, but I'm just telling you what you should do. OK, that's fair. CMAs, comparative market analysis, or competitive market analysis, we don't do those anymore. Because everyone does a free CMA, whether it's for a $200,000 property or a 10 million. Comparative market analysis, nothing compares to my property. My property is above, is the best thing you've ever seen. We're familiar with that. So what we do are professional opinion of value, a POV. Professional, talks about who we are. Opinion, lets them know that, hey, if you want to go back and forth on this, this is just my opinion. I'll explain to you how I arrived at my opinion. We can have that consultation. And then value. They understand value very, very much. So this goes back to the linguistic side of it, where everything that we say, we want it to ring true and we want them to receive. We want to speak to them in a way that when they hear it, we're speaking their language. Professional opinion of value. So we're going to offer professional opinion of values for their properties, for their homes. In your market, I can tell you, professional opinions of values are not being offered. Free CMAs are being offered every day, right? And so understand that we're not giving free CMA. We're doing a detailed professional opinion of value. We got that? All right, we're going to go for eight more minutes. Okay, Selling Luxury Homes. That's a book written by Jack Cotton. But what he has done, he has taken his book and he has, if you go to, so you can go to jackcotton.com, but I just find everything on YouTube from him. All of his links and everything will be in there. But if you go in and if you watch and if you listen, he's telling us step by step how to uh, turn our business uh, into a successful one. Before I go back to Jack, I'm going to talk about one or a couple of other uh, people. Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, and I'm going to spell the last name. So his last name is Oxley, but it's spelled O. E C 
H S L I O E C H S L I Matt Oxley Matt Oxley his book The Art of Selling to the Affluent The Art of Selling to the Affluent what Matt Oxley has done he's created the Oxley Institute Matt Oxley has picked up where Dr. Thomas Stanley left off when he passed away Okay, so Matt Oxley is when it comes to the mindset and the, psych, psych, uh, the psychology of the affluent, he's really picked up and he's helping us understand how the affluent think, how they operate, what's really affecting their decision making and what, what isn't. So he's a great person for uh, you to uh, study and look into because I'm going to actually use a couple of um, images from him. And then the last one is Selling Luxury is a, is a fantastic book, Selling Luxury. From Robin, R-O-B-I-N, Lent, L-E-N-T, and then Genevieve, G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E, -E -E, Tour, T-O-U-R, Genevieve Tour. And I know it sounds like a lot of information and a lot of resources, but that's because there are. Right? And I'm telling you that if you put the time in on the front end, if you dive in and, and, and if you really become a student, remember I said study to show yourself approved. The difference between those who are excellent and those who have dreams and aspirations but never do is that they haven't first learned and then they haven't learned it. Now you'll also see FloridaRealtors.org, we talked about that one, uh, NAR.Realtor, and then YouTube. Another fantastic resource is going to be established real estate, real estate practitioners. So when I say that, people say, well, Neil, why would another agent tell me their game? Why would they tell me how to be successful? Let me tell you where you're going to find them. Immediately, when I say find your mentor, you probably started thinking locally. Get outside of your local market. Find a mentor in an outside market who, can, who you can share information with. And it's best if they're not in Florida. Here's why. Now, I can give them, we know everyone wants to come here. Even if it's for just a vacation property, second home, investment. What we want is we want to be able to give them that same, those market reports, the members only reports. We want to give those market reports to our mentor or colleague or partner outside of Florida. And what are we going to ask from them? The same thing from California, New York, New Jersey, right? Because now, if I have that information, I'm in um, Broward or Miami-Dade. Not only am I doing my reports on Miami and Broward single-family homes, I'm also talking about what's happening in New York now with their market. Hey, in New York, you know, they're using co-ops, and then I talk about co-ops versus condos, something that might be foreign unless you're coming from Canada, right? And they, they purchase a lot of co-ops, then I talk about all of that, you, right? So I get that information, and my mentor, Jack Cotton from Cape Cod, he has, he has no other, he has no reason for me to want me to do anything other than succeed, because now when he has a referral, if I'm as good as he hopes I am, He's confident when he sends a referral down, right? And then he knows that I'm going to do the same thing when I reciprocate and send uh, referrals back to him. Uh, another great place for us to look right now, if you are not looking at agents in Las Vegas, reach out to Las Vegas as well. So just so we understand the way the market happens here in the U.S., usually things happen first in New York, okay? Then after New York, we're seeing things happen in Las, uh, Las Vegas and Phoenix. And then we're seeing that trend happen over here in Florida. All right. So I don't know why that's the case. California is its own world. OK. No. Really, so 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 because because just, just because of the values in California, we can't like because of the, the the Eastern money coming in and the Asian money coming in there. It hasn't hit Florida yet. It doesn't go to Las Vegas. It goes to Texas. So we can't really look at what they're doing in California, but we can look and see what's happening in New York because what happens in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania has an impact on us. But when we see New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, then we look over in Las Vegas and whatever happens in Las Vegas, I don't know why, it's very, very likely that we're going to get some type of mirror here. My, we got into the team that I was on, we got into REOs a year and a half before there was any REO crisis here in Florida. 
because my mentor, Chris Saunders, said, hey, in Las Vegas, they're getting slammed. And he started looking at, he said, hey, do you, he was in Colorado. He was in Colorado. He was telling me what was happening in Las Vegas. And he said, now prepare in Miami. We got the very first, from the big uh, flux, we got the first 100 REOs from Bank of America that hit Florida, that hit South Florida, came into my team and the team that I was on. Just because we were prepared, we had already had the entire system set up. So he was like, here, the, you all know all like the five star and all these REO conferences and everything. We were going to the conferences before REOs even hit. But that's because our mentor had told us how to find it. And we didn't have to do it ourselves. Had we had a mentor that was in North Florida, or had we had a coach in North Florida or a colleague in North Florida, we wouldn't have known until everyone else had known. Right? So get outside of the areas that we're in. All right, that's going to be it for now. We're going to be back at 3.15. There's not going to be any clapping or anything at 3.15. I'm just going to start talking, and we're going to knock out the rest of this. Uh, so we have to get creative on how to quiet down a room. So one of the resources, so real quick, Helen, uh, Helen, raise your hand so everyone can know who I'm talking I'm talking about her in front of her face, not behind her back. Helen just asked me a question, uh, and we were talking about original list price. So when I talk about list price to sales price ratio, am I using original list price or the list price when it's sold? I want to make sure that stats and the lead of Florida Realtors and NAR. So we use original list price to sales price ratio. And then her rebuttal is, well, what if the seller says, okay, well, I'll just raise my price higher, right? If I'm getting 84%, if I list it, you know, 50% higher, that means I'm going to get more money. And then people, did, our, our response is people didn't get wealthy or didn't get, make their money by being stupid. Okay, that's the reality. And, and so one of the things that I would ask Helen, if she was a seller and she said that to me, I would say, well, Helen, before you make an important purchasing decision like this, wouldn't you do your homework? Right, and the answer is gonna be yes. Wouldn't you have your team do their homework as well? Yes. Now, Helen, do you think that you would be, that you would as a, a lay person, someone not in the real estate industry, before you even ask for my help as a realtor, do you have an I do you think you would have an idea of what you think the property is worth by using all these third party sites and all this information? She said yes. So that's the same conversation I'm going to have with my seller if they're being unrealistic with the price. All right. So real quick, one of the examples that I want to show you and when we talk about ways to set ourselves apart. So we're going to skip over. I, I don't want you all worrying about finishing in time. We are going to finish. We're going to skip over that polyglot knot section uh, about, because I've already talked about we're going to, we just have to talk about service, right? Service is the language that we speak. That is um, what is most important. Ability to actively said, being a professional problem solver, a PPS. Before I get to a PPS, this idea right here. So this is my pre-marketing book. How many of you do a pre-marketing book for your listings? Everyone should be doing a pre-marketing book for your listings. What I've done is Jack Cotton, once again, a nugget that he's thrown out hundreds of times, if not thousands. My pre-marketing book, this is a photo album from Shutterfly or from Peekaboo. I took, I took a photo album and I, every one of my sellers, when they inquire online, they get a photo album either couriered to them or FedEx to them overnight. In our market, this is not happening. So what I know, if you inquire, if you go in uh, on my website, or if you contact me asking for uh, a, asking a question or a marketing consult for a marketing consultation, the first thing you're going to get is a hardbound book, and this is just generic, right? And the reason I want it says thank you for contacting Neil Oates. It's going to tell them about our initial consultation. I do a two-part marketing consultation. All right. So I'm going to use this. And so now what I know is I know that in my market, my competition does a one visit consultation. Neil, what, are you worried about losing business? No, because before my competition gets there, and before I get there, they're going to have this sitting on their coffee table. I know they are. And my competition is going to see it and they're going to be like, dang, we lost. 
right? I've had friends come into uh, marketing consultations and they came in, they called me after. They say, Neil, we were just at 123 South Street. We saw your book. It shook me a little bit, probably shouldn't tell you, but it's one of those healthy competition type deals, right? And so the reason I don't, I'm not concerned about, about losing someone or a seller on my marketing, on my two-part marketing consultation is because in here, I'm going to say, I can't give you a prescription before I have a, before I'm able to give you a diagnosis. Right? And I'm going in my conversation, I'm going to tell them, Mr. Seller, Miss Seller, many of my colleagues are going to come in, they're going to bring with them comps. And I would never bring comps to your home because I know there's no such thing as a comp. I'm going to bring relevant properties. So we don't bring comps or comparables, we bring relevant properties or relevant transactions. Okay, we want to make sure that we're not using words that are going to put our clients, prospects, or customers on the defensive before we have a chance to speak. So we don't want to use comparables or comps. We want to say relevant properties or relevant transactions. And so I'm going to sell them on the fact that they're going to get this received. Now my courier is an Uber driver, okay? And so what I do is I pay him a couple of extra bucks to get out of his Uber and just take this and deliver it to the seller's house, okay? So that's cheaper than an actual courier service. So you have to get creative. I have a driving service that picks up my clients from, it's just Uber XL. It's one of the guys who drives the Cadillac Escalade. Very nice. I've ridden with him a couple of times. Amazing guy. So what I've asked him to do is that when I call him and I need him to pick up my guys, I just need him to take the little Uber thing off. I need him to put a shirt or tie on and I need him to be my driver for that day or whatever. And I make sure he's taken care of because it's about the experience. So get creative, figure out how to do things that people in your market aren't doing and then you have opportunities. So that talks about the initial consultation, talks about my second appointment. And then it talks about the pricing process. So before I get there, they know what the pricing process is going to be. It's not going to be me coming in and pulling properties. I'm telling them that I'm going to have a pricing panel, a pricing council is going to come through their property and we're going to consult. They're going to do a consultation and let me know what they believe the property is, going, is, is worth. Now what this is, all this is, this gives me a chance to do a broker's open before I get the listing so I have an idea and it gives me an opportunity to get exposure to the property before it's on the market. Now Neil, why would you want brokers coming into the property before? Because I do the same thing for them when they ask me to be on their pricing panel. Especially if you have a challenging seller that says, I know I should be at, like Helen said, I know I should be at seven million. You're like, but it's gonna sell at five. Do I take this listing? Well, you just want to say that because you want your commission faster. That's what they're going to tell us, right? I know it's worth this. Well, I'm going to have my pricing panel come in. They're going to be from various companies, various brokerages. They might be from outside of the area. Now, the reality is they might be all from my team. You never know. But you create a pricing uh, panel, a pricing board that is going, a pricing committee that's going to come in. And then in here, what I do is get some way. I want everyone in here, find some way to get a photo of you teaching, speaking, or doing something. Because why? Because this photo right here, we, I'm in Tampa, they had the class, and we had a class in one, uh, in the university in their courthouse setting, right? So it was a judicial thing. But right here, that immediately adds credibility when you see it. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do, all of the testimonials, if you're not using real satisfied or some way to get written testimonials from your clients, get the testimonials, put them in here. When you say it about yourself, it's bragging. When someone else says it about you, it's a testimonial, okay? Because now, when my past clients tell them, when they get this, how awesome I am, and then at the end, I find some way Get a photo of you being recorded. Because if they get a photo of you, you who is it? Now, this is, now this is when Florida Realtors were recording me, but that was done at my church, right? So I do a lot of videos. Get a, a photo of you with a microphone in your hand with people looking at you. Now, these are just the hacks. I'm telling you all the, the absolute truth. People want to say, well, who were you? What were you talking about? And it was some small panel with maybe like six people in the room. But do you know that right there? No. 
And the reality is that their perception of you is going to be your reality, okay? And then designations, all that information right here. But when this gets to them, I already have a foot in the door. So I picked up something uh, a couple of weeks ago from Grant Wise, uh, and he asked a question that I'm going to ask you, or a statement, he made a statement, uh, and, and I've adopted it years ago, but I just haven't been able to put it into words until I listen to Grant. He says, you should not be speaking to anyone about real estate who doesn't already know who you are and what you do. You should not be speaking to anyone in real estate or about real estate who doesn't know who you are or what you do. So my job is to make sure that before I'm face to face speaking to a client or before I'm cold calling the way my business is set up, I believe what Grant says, they should know what I do. They should know that I specialize in luxury single family homes in Broward and international buyers. If they haven't done that, then why are we speaking? Because now I have to sell myself. If they haven't gotten this, that means I've got to go through an hour of why you should use me. Okay? If they've gotten this, and, I, and one of my uh, assistants has called and said, hey, have you had a chance to review the information that Neil had delivered to your property? If they say no, well, should we reschedule to a later date until you had a chance to review it? Well, now what I'm going to tell them is, because Neil wants to make sure that he values your time, the reality is I'm not going to talk to you if you don't even already know who I am. Okay, does that make sense to you all? Any questions so far? All right, so we're skipping that polyglot, and so all, all polyglot was talking about, we don't have to know the um, luxury brands in order to be successful, as long as you speak service, that's what that's talking about there. Now we're going to get to how do you find the affluent? Everyone is familiar with Where's Waldo, right? Okay, who can tell me where Waldo is in this photo? Who's already found Waldo? Good stuff. Have you seen the photo before? You just got a good eye like that. Okay, good stuff. So hopefully you can find your clients that quickly as well. So here, here's how most people would find Waldo. Here, here's what we go through. So the thought process is Waldo always has a what on? And what else? Uh, he always has a hat. So when we're looking for our affluent clientele, we need to identify habits and know what they're doing and what they aren't doing. Waldo, so they're in here shopping. Waldo doesn't need a hat, right? So we know Waldo is not going to be over here. So we're just going to eliminate this whole section. Now we know that Waldo does not do laundry because he's wearing the same clothes all the time. So he's not going to be over here next to the half naked guy at all. All right. Waldo doesn't need a coat because he has a sweater on. So we're going to eliminate this entire half of the picture and then we'll find Waldo right up there at the top. All right. So now this is a funny example, but I'm sorry. So, so there's Waldo right there. And so the reason that I use this example is that once we identify and we know the behaviors and we know uh, the attributes or, or the characteristics of the affluent, then we can start moving our business towards that. The same thing uh, applies to the question I asked, if I'm in this market, do I want to specialize in condos if I'm looking for the affluent or work in the luxury niche? The answer was no. Now, if I wanted to, I probably could, but it might be harder, okay? So this goes back to where do I want to find, or how do I want to find them? I do want to back up. Next to communication and negotiation, keen valuation skills, keen valuation skills. This means that it's one of the hardest skills next to negotiation. I believe it's hard in the luxury realm, being able to value properties is harder than being able to communicate and harder to, than negotiating. Being able to value a property because the value, the properties are so unique and different, right? But when you're really, really, really good, you, that's how you'll know. You'll know when you start looking at properties in the MLS and you visit them in person. How many of you are, are previewing properties? previewing luxury properties. So you should be previewing as, get into the product as much as possible, okay? So when you preview a property and you start doing your research and studying, and if that property closes and you're within a realistic price point of where it closes, that's when you start to know. So you don't have to have the listing itself. Start going into the MLS, start looking at properties. Look at, look at ones that are already pending, if that's the case, and you can say, let me see if I can realistically guess or guesstimate or estimate where this property is going to sell, where it's going to close. Now, you might, if you're way off, like way, way, way off, 
right? And there are some extenuated circumstances where it might be different. It might be a, a fire cell or something like that. It might be an inner family transfer. But if you start doing that on a consistent basis and you start knowing where properties are going to sell, that can help you when you have your listing or when you have a buyer. Does everyone understand? All right, understanding of relevant terminology. In Broward County, we have a lot of properties that have butler pantries and pot fillers just because they are more of a southern style, bigger property. And so make sure that you know what relevant terminology is in your area. Now, how do you find out what the relevant terminology is? Go into the MLS, read the descriptions that agents are putting in there. If there's, if there's a specific feature that keeps coming up, and if you don't know what the word means, Google it. Okay, I know it sounds simple, but the worst thing you can do is have your client say, you know, does this property have you like, let me ask the butler. I don't right, right? Right? Or a pot filler. And you're like, and, uh, okay, what's a pot filler? Does anyone know what a pot filler is? What is it? Any guesses? It is the water spigot, it's the faucet over the stove. Okay, now here's something. If someone says uh, that, and it's, you don't always hear it, but me coming from Alabama, uh, I've, I've been familiar with pot fillers for a while with, with those who, not in my hometown, but the, the ladies would say, I need to make sure that the property has a pot filler. Now, if there's a pot filler, what can you assume about the utilities or, or the range? What can you assume about the range? That is going to be a gas range, okay? So that's just something that if they ask about the pot filler, just for me to show them that I understand them and what they're looking for. Okay, so how many eyes do you want in this gas range? Do you want the standard four, do you want five, or do you want six, All right? Because usually the pot filler is going to be in the middle Everyone understand, right? And so now I'm speaking their language and it shows once again that I've been here before, right? So that's why go into your MLS, start reading the uh, descriptions of the properties that you want to list and get familiar with the terminology, all right? And then uh, if you really, you can even tie that into uh, some of your videos that you're sending out so you can make sure, so that the clients and customers know that you speak their language, okay? Who are the affluent? What are their occupations? Okay, so these are going to be a couple of resources that I want you to use. Fact Finder, F-A-C-T, F-I-N-D-E-R, Fact Finder, dot, census, C-E-N-S-U-S, -S, dot gov. Fact Finder, dot, census, dot gov. A lot of those, uh, so in there, it will tell you based on zip code what the occupations are for the demographic in your uh, neighborhood, in your locale. So for me, I came and I did it using RPR. Is everyone here familiar with RPR? Realtors Property Resource. Pull up the zip code. So I pulled up the zip code 963. And then I just clicked on any property in 963. It was the, the property wasn't important, but in property, once I was in the property, I clicked on economy and then I clicked on, um, I believe it is um, demographic or, or, or something like that. So I think it was economy or lifestyle. And what I found out is that in 963, 91% of people own their property, okay? The median age for the owners in 963 is 66 years old. 48% of them are men, okay? The household, 47, 471 households in that zip code. No, I'm sorry, this is for the county right here. In the county, 471 uh, households are married with children. 4,361 are married without children. So now, we remember how I said, how, how are we gonna find our clientele, how are we gonna find our affluent? We're going to go in and we're going to say, okay, well, now, if me, in my county, in Broward, in one of the zip codes, I'm all about family and children. So that's why I'm, I'm volunteering. So the, the families know me, I'm at the school. Here, that can't be, that can't be my way in, right? Because our median age is about 45, and, we, and the, it's vice versa, with married with children versus married without children. Okay, and then 55 households are single with children. 
Okay, occupation, we start saying, well, where are the affluent? Now, this is for zip code 963. These are the big um, occupations, healthcare and social assistance, real estate, rental and leasing, and then professional, scientific, and technical work. Zip code 963, 61% Republican. Then we start talking about household income, annual income, 525, uh, 525 uh, households have an income of 125,000 to 150 a year, 150,000 a year. 2,500 households have an income of more than 150,000 a year. Okay? So do you all see the difference? And that's why it's so important where we can start to see how can I identify, how can I find the affluent? Now we're going to talk about right here. How do you find them? You're going, the first way you're going to find them is you're going to go around them to find them. Who do they use? Everyone said attorneys. How many of you are sending out professional opinion of values to, well, let's use accountants first, or um, tax uh, accountants or tax attorneys? Professional opinion of value or, or CMA. Every year, especially for the estates, for the affluent who have their properties in a state, every year they need to have some type of value done for their properties, for the portfolio. A great way. Start sending out now examples of professional opinion of value for a high value property. Do a professional opinion of value. I use RPR because I'm trying to do it easy. I want it to look professional. I do it on um, resume paper. So I use resume paper and I flip my resume paper upside down. So the, the resume paper with the linen on it, you all familiar with that, that has the, the textures in the field. Instead of reading it where you have the linen on top, I flip it upside down because how many fingers are on the back? Four fingers on the back when you read. So I know that when my attorneys or my accountants or my uh, tax uh, advisors or my um, estate planners, when they get it, they're going to say, oh, this is quality paper. Right? And then that's going to be secondary to what, and these are just the little hacks that we've picked up from my mentors. They're like, Neil, take the resume paper, flip it upside down. I'm like, why does it matter? See what response you get. And then I just do a leather bound um, thing from um, Home Depot, I'm sorry, Office Depot, right? But I'm sending out probably 40 or 50 of those a year, right? Just to prospect to those attorneys, accountants, estate planners. Because then in November, December, January, they're contacting me for actual professional opinions of values for their class estates. And I might do that for two, three years, four years. But when the estate sells, guess who they're coming to? Me. And I want, I am willing to put in the time to work five years for the estates that I'm selling. Does that make sense? And then they're telling me about other people. And then if it's something else, you know, because birds of a feather flock together, that once you get into that circle, that's just a great way to get in. Bank trust officers, accountants, administrative assistants, financial planners, tax advisors, those are a few people that you want to get in. Um, let me see, do I want to, okay, we're going to move through this really quickly because I want you all to, Matt Oxley, the Oxley Institute, Google him, Google the Oxley Institute, all of this information is going to be there. The only purpose for this information is I want us to see what we are taking for granted, all right? This pyramid, talking about the number of millionaires between one and five million, this is for investable assets, okay? 5 million to 30 million, 30 million plus. This 14.86 million millionaires, 1.5 million millionaires here is less than 2% of the global population, okay? So what's in your backyard, don't take for granted, get really, really good, and then what you'll see is that most of the world's wealth is not in the US. If you get really good in your backyard, in what is it, 963? If you get really good in 963, it's going to open up global money. And if you do one, two, three good ones in your backyard, you'll be doing deals in California. About 40% of my business is I never touch the transaction because I'm referring clients before they get into the U.S. US Toronto, I'm sending them over to uh, Ottawa, I'm sending them to New York. Phoenix, Orlando, I'm never touching deal, but that's about 40% of my income coming in. So that's why I get to go around and speak and teach and then still make uh, do real estate. Does that make sense? So look up these stats here. And it, so I'm going, now here's what, if you're going to be doing anything in luxury, 
Get to know what's happening in London. London is the preferred destination for the world's wealthiest people. Hands down, no question. It's been that way for 20 years. We do not see it changing. Right now, London is not sexy. Dubai is sexy. Do, like, we like hearing about Dubai. We like hearing about the new money, the oil money, the flash and the show. London is old money, but that's the desired destination for the world's wealthiest people. So know what they care about. Know what's happening in London. Okay, know what's coming out of London as far as trends, because it is, it's, if nothing more, it will be a little bit of conversation at a cocktail party. Okay. And then we here, we're here, we'll see that in the U.S., we're still looking at New York as the largest as far as in terms of wealth. Uh, but then here's what I want us to look at. So you'll see this is South Florida. Okay. The number of millionaires that we have here in South Florida, Central Florida, or just in Florida in general, is not even close to what's in Mexico City, right? And that, that, like, that's like, wow, right? Because we're conditioned and we're taught that there's nothing coming from south of the border but bad, okay? A lot of the Hispanic money and the Latin money is going into Mexico City. Make relationships with agents in Mexico City. When things turn and they start and the US dollar is expected to fall in about eight to nine months. When that happens, a lot of the money from Mexico City is going to make its way into the US because of our judicial system that is favorable for property ownership. Okay? So that's where you have to start looking and saying, okay, yes, we like New York, we like Los Angeles, the Bay Area, but who can I connect with here? So that when things change, that money goes from Mexico City into here, and I'm getting them before they get into the country. Does everyone understand what we're looking at? Knight Frank Report. Look at the Knight Frank Report. Everyone should get familiar with the Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. K-N-I-G-H-T. Knight Frank Report. So where uh, can we uh, network or meet with the affluent? So here's where a few of them may be. So we hear all the time golf. We hear golf, 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 golf. I cannot play golf to save my life. I went to Top Golf one time. I swung once and I just sat down because it was over my hip, knees, ankle, everything was over. But me coming from Alabama, what I'm really good at is shooting. So in Broward County at Markham Park, we have a skeet and a trap range. So now what I do is I know, right, thumbs up. So see, for me, I know now that if I go out there in my shooter's jacket with my shotgun, I'm in a neighborhood, I'm in a range, in, uh, in the proximity of people that I want to do business with. These are people where when all of my other colleagues are saying, we're going to shoot, God, we're going to play golf, I know that what they're going to spend all day doing, I can probably get done in an hour. OK, have some conversation as we're setting up, as we're talking about the models of our shotguns and the rifling and all this, you know, talking about what happened on that last set that we shot. But it's unique for me. And plus, and trust me, when I step out there on the range, I stand out. OK, and it's not just my shooters, Jack. You guys get where I'm coming from. Right. And so but then if I do that, and I'm like, OK, now when we get done shooting, guess what we're doing? Now we're going to hang out. Now we're, I'm now I'm inside that circle. So you want to figure out whatever it is for you. It might be tennis, squash, golf, cricket is coming as big down uh, in Miami. But what we're learning is that cricket is bigger with the Haitian market in Miami than it is with the affluent market. That's just in my area. OK, so those might be some ideas uh, that you can think about. Now, all of this is from the NAR, the National Association of Realtors Report, just talking about international money uh, coming in and where money is going, the number of millionaires. So you start looking at, so this is for Latin America, Mexico City. People sleep on Mexico City because we're always hearing about uh, what's happening in Colombia. We're always hearing about what's happening in Venezuela. But when it comes to wealth, let's change the way we think just a little bit. And all of these reports are available uh, from, I believe this is the National Association of Realtors. All right, so I'm going to, money thoughts. Here's what I want us to look at for just a little bit. Next to, next to investable assets, when we talk about people from the $1 million to $5 million wealth range, next to this their investable assets, equities, fixed incomes, their biggest value, their, their biggest expense, their biggest asset is what? Principal residence, 16%.
Huge deal. So they're putting a lot of money into their principal residence. Now this is for uh, from one to five million wealth range. What we were talking about earlier is that understand that usually between the one to five million, that's the closest to new money, okay? So new money, they've had their money for less than five years. So their net worth or their investable assets hasn't gone up to five million or more yet. What we'll see in the old money, when you start talking about 30 million and plus, their primary residence drops down to about maybe 5% because now they're not, their primary residence is no longer the McMansion, all right? Now their primary residence might be a $400,000 place. Okay, you all with me there, all right? The, the, yes, ma'am. 5% of 30 million is a lot more money than 16%. Yes, but, but see, now that is also, no, nah, no, nah. so, so it's, it's also because they're putting more money into their investable assets. So I'm, I'm just using five, but it's always, uh, it's always a lot less. Um, just like, for instance, I, and I know we always talk about the Oracle of Omaha, but Warren Buffett, if you look at him, I think he's a great example, but, and, and his circle, um, just about how, like, that's, I think, the truest example of the way wealth, that's the truest example of the way wealth thinks. So we start looking at him and his friends and who he hangs with. Like, I, I want to be in Warren's circle, right? And, and, and operate how they do. Yes. So here, right here, um, household wealth. So this is still talking about one million to five or five million plus automobiles. Now I know this is where I always get the biggest pushback. Neil, they always spend a lot more money on automobiles than 25,000. 25,000, you can't even get a Chevy pickup now. Right? I'm telling you that from Matt Oxley and the Oxley Institute, these numbers are being updated. Now this is also globally, okay? What we see, we, we tend to remember the flashy wealth, okay? Understand that old money or established wealth might drive a $25,000 or less vehicle. That might be the case. Now we're, we're associating Tesla with wealth. That's not necessarily the case. The one of the highest selling cars uh, for the affluent was, it, it is a hybrid car, an electric car, but it was the Volt. Is that, is that a Chevy, Chevy Volt, right? But then like, so that was, that was one of the highest ones bought and then they discontinued it if I'm not mistaken. Right? I'm sorry? Well, well, but I mean, that, that's what the affluent bought. Okay, and so that's where I'm going into houses in Southwest Ranches, and I'm seeing the hookup over there on the wall. I'm like, hmm, Tesla. And then the wife comes in, and it's a Chevy Volt, or they're coming in and like in small cars that might not be electronic, but I'm sorry, that might not be electric, but like a Nissan Versa. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. Right now, don't forget. So they've already gotten past that point where they got that first car, that first, the one that they never thought they would have. All right. Here's, here's what I want us to think about real quick because I don't know how much more time we're going to have. So we'll see that charity is a big part. So fewer households gave in 2018 than in 2017 to charity, but more money was given in 2018 and 2017, okay? Talking about the affluent households. So that's continuing to rise. Look at the difference between, uh, and when they have one to five million, five million plus, the amount that's spent, that's spent more than $5,000, okay? Now you're gonna say that's small, that's a small deal, but I mean, as far as more than $5,000, but the behaviors repeat themselves. So right here, what we're seeing, charity is important. What else are important to the affluent? Travel. So a way for, if you want to speak their language, interview one of the affluent about a, their charity of choice. So on my closings, what I will do is I will donate a portion of my proceeds to their charity of choice. It doesn't matter if it's 100 bucks or 500 bucks, okay? But then I'm going to give them a double whammy because not only am I going to volunteer or donate a portion of my proceeds to their charity in their name, I'm also going to help them out here as my closing gift. I love, love, love Groupon. So instead of my closing gift being a knife or something like that with my name on it, I'm giving them a Groupon coupon to, if they're buying in Florida, for some reason in South Florida, people like going to the Grand Canyon. We like to go from being surrounded by water to having no water at all, right? So I will get them a Groupon trip to Grand Canyon. Now for me, it might only be like 300, 400 bucks, 
but then with that Groupon uh, to the Grand Canyon, with the trip or whatever, right? Um, or now since I've done it for a number of my clients, I started building relationships. And what I'll do is I will give them, the, uh, their closing gift will be a trip. And then I'm going to give them the disposable Fujifilm camera. You, guys are gonna, you, you all know what I'm talking about. Don't play. All right. So I'm going to give that to them. Why? Because I want when they, every time they take a photo and when they print it out and when they look at it, I want them thinking about who? Me. Because if I know that they're like, man, my realtor, not only did he give to charity, but he also gave me a trip as a closing gift. Or even if you want to give a voucher towards a trip that you can get creative because when we hopefully get the number of coconuts that we want, that's going to be a drop. OK, now when I do that and when they're on the trip and when they take photos and when they post photos online, who are they going to think about and who are they going to talk about to every one of their friends? Me, I'm in. So that's something that you can do. And because when we see what's important to them. Let's make what's important to them important to us, and then we give back, and that's an easy way in. And this is where I was talking about 83% uh, have an undergraduate degree or higher, 91% uh, uh, are in, 76% are married. Very, very important to understand why, the, why are the affluent and wealthy, why are they married? Why? Tax. Tax. It's a business decision. I'm not saying that love is not involved. I'm just saying you find love a lot faster. So, and we, we're judgmental. We'll say, well, this gentleman or this woman, she got divorced or the spouse passed away and she remarried within six months. Heck yeah, that's a smart person, right? Not fast when there's a lot on the line. So understand what we see, and that's counter uh, cultural. So culturally, we're seeing high divorce rates, but in the affluent market and with the luxury um, in the luxury realm, we're not seeing that. That's not happening. Okay, everyone, good there. All of those. Now, what this is, this talks about in our cities. The cities that have at least one percent of their housing stock exchanging in the million dollar plus value market, and so this is where, like I said, California is its own deal, just because the value is over there. But all of this is information that you can get by looking up uh, at nar.realtor, nar.realtor. That's where this comes in. And so we in Florida, we think that we have a lot more money. Uh, and the median home price, we always think that we're doing fantastic, but then you start looking at other, other cities in our country, uh, and, and then we, it really puts us into perspective. All right, gatekeepers we talked about. Uh, the gatekeepers are going to be those people uh, that can either help us or hurt us. Those are going to be the estate and probate attorneys. Lenders specializing in jumbo loans. No, I'm sorry, that's the connection that we want to make. Where's my gatekeeper? Okay, we're good there. All right, so here, here's what I want us to do. To become the agent of choice because we are out of time. We've got five minutes. Becoming the agent of choice. Here's the action plan that I want us uh, to uh, take along with the guy jumping over. Position yourself and your business to appeal to the client. Does your business... Is it appealing to who you want to work with? Okay, if you would not do business with yourself, if you were an affluent seller or buyer, stop, change something. If you wouldn't do business with you, why should anyone else? Okay, fair? That's a very hard but a question that you must ask yourself. Necessary to package, promote, and position yourself as a quality prod a product. You must sell yourself first before you can sell a product or a service. If they don't buy you, you're dead in the water. It's not going to happen. Um, first, sell your, yourself and your ability to exceed their expectations using your experiences and skills. If, you, if every time you, we were taught to that you either meet someone's expectations or you don't. That is not the case. If you don't exceed the expectation of the customer, do not exceed them. There are so many of us that if I'm not ecstatic about the service you provide, I can go somewhere else. You all believe that? If I have the opportunity to work with anyone that I want to and to work with the best, and if you do not show yourself as the best, why would I come back to you? Why would I tell anyone about you? It's not going to happen. I would rather give that opportunity to someone else. 
Um, uh, work to become the expert. So we talked about competency, knowledge, connections, and relationships with other professionals. Here we are. Real estate attorneys, get to know them. Get to know real estate attorneys. Estate and probate attorneys. Now, I did not put on here a tax attorney. So understand that an accountant and a tax attorney are not the same thing. You should have your team include all of these ad tax attorney on there. Accountant, housekeeping services, moving company, interior design, storage company, okay? My next one is one of my favorite. Discretion. Don't sell and tell. I never tell who my clients are. If they want to tell, if they want to say, Neil, thank you, or whatever, that's fine, that's on them. Discretion, silence is golden, just like when you're in the movies. Discretion will steal, because there are more old money, people who ascribe to the more conservative way of doing business, there's still more mid and old money than there is new money mentality. Okay, so if we err on the side of what the 80% are doing, the 20%, if they want photos with you, and if they want photos and new keys and all that, so we have to be countercultural with, with what we're seeing in the culture and in our industry, okay? So discretion is still key. Um, non-disclosure, so uh, get familiar with assigning a non-disclosure act or non-disclosure letters or something like that, or NDA, okay? So that might be where, hey, we don't, you can't tell, so what I do is I ask my client or the gatekeeper or my point of, point of contact, do you want a non-disclosure agreement signed before we begin? Once again, I'm speaking their language. I want them to know that I value their privacy and their privacy and service is more important than me getting likes on Facebook. Okay, and once I, once I introduce that up front, hey, would you like an NDA signed before we begin? And they're gonna say, no, that's not necessary or thank you for asking. They'll usually say, thank you for asking, no, it's not necessary, or yes, we were gonna ask if you would, we didn't know how to bring it up. I just, I'm just bringing it up right in front because I know that my competition is not asking that, okay? Um, and then we're gonna jump to taking action. Choose an area of specialization. Laser focus works best, and this is how we're gonna finish out. Specific geographic location. So it could be a zip code, okay? It could be a type of property, single family versus condo. Here, I don't want to tell you what to do, but don't choose condo, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, the one person, I, th that one person that is already doing it in the lesser condo, you like, like, Neil, thank you for telling him not to be in my competition, right? So, hobbies that interest you. Find a, something like, I like skeet and crap. We were just back home, and my mom, so we were back home for her retirement party, and we're like, Mom, what do you want to get? for your retirement, what do you want to get you? And my mom, she, like I said, she was a retired educator. She just finished her 25 years in the Alabama education system. And she said, I just need some money to, to go get my stuff off of layaway. I'm like, layaway? What you got on layaway, Ma? I, I can go get it, trust me. She's like, I got my gun. On I'm like, you got your what on? I'm like, so my wife said, do you want us to go get it today? We can go get it today. And she was like, nah, because I get it today, I'm gonna want to go out and shoot today. Right? And so for my mom who just turned, what, 63? So to hear her talking about, you know, she wants to go out in the backyard and shoot, right? So because we've got land out there, find out what your hobby is and then take that. And there's usually a way for you to weave that into someone in the affluent market, okay? Become the chosen niche expert first. So you want to utilize all of those resources, all of those books and know everything you can about that niche before you tell anyone. This is how we So you want to do all of your background. You want to know everything the competition is doing. You want to know what the market is moving. And like you want to know what's happening in London. You want to know what's happening on the US luxury market because it's in US luxury isn't moving anymore. Then you want to say, okay, well, it's, it was moving in New York and then know why it was moving in New York understand why we're expecting it to stop in New York and to move to South Florida. You all understand where we're coming. Because what's going to happen is the people that you're going to want to work with, they know this stuff because they have time to look because it's important for them. We get so busy trying to get a deal and a transaction that we forget to look at the big picture and study. Okay, so you want to become the niche uh, expert first. Preview as many luxury properties as you can. 
agent preview, agent preview, agent preview. And then after you get done previewing the property, get the phone out. If the agent is okay with you doing it while you're in there, fine. If not, get it out after you're done. Record yourself in front of the property, leaving the property, talking about that property, talking about the pot filler, talking about the parking space or the architectural design or the location, the neighborhood, something. Get out there in front of people on video. Increase your luxury marketplace knowledge. So courses uh, that we talked about, the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing, I think is a fantastic one. If you are familiar with CRS, the Council for Residential Specialists, um, or for the Certified Residential Specialists, they have a great class that uh, the behaviors of the affluent, and um, it's one that Jack Cotton wrote. I don't get anything from uh, him to promote him. I just believe that he's the best doing it, and that's giving it all away. Okay, so if you guys talk to Jack or um, see Jack, make sure you tell him that Neil is still out here uh, with his pom-poms. All right? Uh, so the list of reading materials, partner with experienced agents in the luxury niche outside of our market. So you might want to go outside of Florida. Las Vegas is a great place. Colorado is a great place to look. Look out in California. Now, when you're in California, most of the agents that you're going to communicate with in California are going to be what we consider luxury based on price point. Just don't deal with anyone in California. Make sure they're legit. Make sure that they're good because they could be telling you things, but that would be the equivalent of our $300,000 price point. Okay? And, and we just saw that they're high uh, on the list there. And then brand yourself as a luxury specialist. So use avenues such as YouTube, Instagram, connect with luxury agents, have communications. One of the best ways to brand yourself as a luxury agent is to go on to other affluent agents or luxury agents sites or pages or posts and comment, ask questions about the property, ask them how the market is doing in how uh, the market is happening in their area. And then they're going to say, oh, well, they're asking poignant questions to me. Ask about their days on market for the one million to three million dollar price band. That's not a question that we get, right? And so they're gonna say, huh, let me see what's going on here. And then after you build a relationship, you want to say, hey, do you have a YouTube channel or a YouTube video that I can like and follow? Start commenting. You want to be seen with the right crowd outside of your market. I don't want you guys to be seen with your competition right here every day. I want you to be identified by great agents, luxury agents outside of here, so that when they think of Indian River, Vero, when they think of this area, then they think of you. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, create your own YouTube channel specifically centered around the affluent lifestyle. I went on GoDaddy. So you don't have to have a website, but I went on GoDaddy. There are a lot of great domains uh, that are available. For instance, I own BrowardAffluent.com. Right? Now, it has nothing to do with real estate, but what BrowardAffluent.com is, I'm going, and I, I just did this last night too, by the way, right? So, <laughs> right? so you're like, dang. So they, they have some great domains that are available. I'm just going to point that to my Broward Facebook page, and all it has is just affluent individuals. It's a private, closed page. So now when they go to BrowardAffluent.com, people want to request to be a part. And once I get their name and their Facebook thing, now I can go and I can research them all I want, and I'm just pushing Broward Affluent. Right? Does that make sense to you all? So find a way to uh, create a page or a group business page, something like that. All right, And then create a market report. That's what I was talking about, the, the market update report. You can do a newsletter if you want. I don't like sending electronic newsletters. I like sending my face in video format. I want people to see me, hear me, feel me when they, uh, when they uh, open it up. Another thing I'm doing for my clients and my sphere or prospects, agents outside of the area, I do a lot of one-to-one -one video messages. So I, I probably do about 100 videos a week uh, just to individuals. Hey, Helen, it's Neil. Thank you so much for coming to my class. Can't wait to see you next time. And I just send it. And that's my prospecting because now, now under there, I'm going to have a link. So instead of giving business cards, I'll do that video. And in that link, I will have a, or, or in the, video message underneath instead of just sending the video. I'm going to put Neil O's Jr. I'm going to put my company name, uh, Luxury Real Estate Specialist, and then I'm going to put my website because now I have a living business card. I want them going to my website or I want them going to my Facebook page. I want them to see me. I want them to get that information and I want to get them in my funnel. Does that make sense? Instead of me doing something and we know that 60% of uh, emails never get open. How many, what, what percentage of your text messages get opened? I'm, I'm sorry? 
98 percent like if you don't if like the text message you don't get is the one from florida the one that don't open the one from florida roots or something right like okay sign up for this but if you get a if you send a video message to someone i've had this happen in classes that i've taught i've had someone i would have my wife send a video message to a person that was sitting in my class i would watch them open that video message while I'm teaching and I've told them no phones, phones off. If you get a video message to your phone, you're going to have to see what it says, right? Why? Because unlike email, we aren't worried about viruses coming over in a MMS message. Does that make sense to you all? Right? And plus I know 98% of text messages get open within the first minute and a half of receipt. So now what agents aren't doing, Neil, you would really do a hundred videos a day? For 98 of them to be open and read, and then for me to say, hey, send me a video back, because you guys can see my personality a little, a little bit out there. Hey, if you're feeling real wild today, send me a video back, I would, I would appreciate it. Now, if I have a client, customer, or an agent in another state, uh, Brian, uh, I actually, Brian Phillips from New York, he hated video, but now when I send him a video, Neil, I'm getting pretty good at this. I sent a video, I even sent one to my client. They responded to me within 30 seconds of them, them needing to list a property. I'm like, Brian, don't get used to that now. That's, that's not gonna happen all the time. But how many video messages do you guys get on a week, in a week? Very few, right? How many text messages do you get? A lot. How, how, how many, how many uh, emails do we get? A lot, right? So why wouldn't you do, remember how I said I'm looking at I came here last time, I was looking at what agents are in the market are doing, videos, what they're not doing and how to get in, a couple of text messages, and I'm not talking about uh, videos through BombBomb, I'm talking about, hey, Joe, hey, Charlie, they're like, oh, he said my name. So you have a reason, and so I'm doing that with a lot with my Fizbos, okay, you know how you go into Fizbos, I'm just giving you guys a game. Fizbo, they have the name, they have their phone number. Every one of my Fizbos is getting a video message from me until they tell me to stop. And my request is, if you want me to stop sending you video, would you please be so kind as to at least do that in video form so that I can see your face? <laughs> it works, right? Neil, just keep sending the videos. I'm not ready yet. Bingo. I got that, right? That's okay with me. Right? Do you all see where we're going? Okay. Um, and then check your local associations, partner with them on high-end or luxury activities. Partner with luxury brands to host events where affluent individuals may be in attendance. And then use a networking organization like meetup.com. So instead, meetup.com, is everyone here familiar with meetup.com? It's a social networking event, uh, service, right, where you can hang out. But Take that and use it for your business purposes. And instead of saying, okay, I'm only going to go out here and talk business, go out there and just hang out. Let people know who you are. So the international clients and the affluent clientele have something, have something, in similar, uh, something very similar that binds them, that they must know you, like you, and trust you before they do business with you in most cases. So that's what makes the international market and the luxury market so cohesive because they must know you, like you, and trust you before they do business with you. And our job is to get in that circle where you're no longer a real estate agent, you're that friend who happens to have their license. Because right now we hate the friend that has the license or the family member that have the license because it's not us, right? How many of us have talked to our clients or customers or prospects and they said, well, no, I'm just gonna listen. I decided to listen with my cousin. I decided to listen with my friend because they have an agent, because they have a license. What if we moved into that space as, well, yeah, we're both friends who have a license, but you know I'm good and they're not, right? So why not move there? All right, that's going to be it. This is how you all can connect with me on Facebook here. YouTube there, Instagram here, Neil Oates Speak Train, Neil Oates, or Mr. World Renowned, uh, just because Mr. Average was taken and I didn't want that name anyway. Um, if you all would, do me a huge favor. Make sure that when you all leave, tell Ashley how, because she actually, I mean, she's amazing. I don't know if you all know that, but she, she's made my stay, my wife's stay so easy, uh, and the visit here uh, has been tremendous. On the, um, the evaluations, I would like all high marks. However, what's more important to me than the high mark are the feedbacks, if you have comments, because not only is my boss, Cheryl Lynn, at Walk the Talk presentation, she's going to get it, but we're also going to make sure that your association gets it. If you want something brought into your association, let them know. They came and they found me, um, and it's because of your request 
that I'm here. So it's not that I came and I'm passed out information. They came to Cheryl in uh, to say, hey, we have a request for this. Who do you know? I hope that you all uh, enjoyed it. I do want to say before you leave, I start my presentation the same way every time uh, with the military. I end my presentation the same every time. I don't know what any of you are going through. I don't know how your day is, your week, or your year is. I want to make sure that you know that I love you. And that's, not, that, that's at a deep level. I want you to know that you're important, that you're powerful. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. And if you ever have any questions, doubts, or anything, make sure you talk to people. If, if you're in a challenging spot in life, talk to people. Just, just look for help because every, no one is strong. No one is so strong that they don't need someone else. So do that for me. And if you see someone, if you know someone, if you love someone and you haven't told them you love them this week, tell them that you love them because we never know. We never know when the last time is. That's because they knew you were going to give me all warns. <laughs> Wait, is one good or bad? I'll get you one. Yes, ma'am.